Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, titled the sermon, Parents, not dads, parents, don't provoke your children. And why do you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 if you have not done? We looked at the first three verses last week. Children, obey your parents, for this is the right thing to do. This is commanded by God, and this is a commandment with a promise. Today, we will we'll look at the mandate that is given to dads, and it's found in Ephesians 6, 4. As we look at this mandate, let me remind you, fathers, parents, there's only one perfect dad in heaven, our heavenly father. There are no perfect fathers here on earth. And so let me remind you that God is not looking for perfect fathers. He's looking for faithful fathers. And he strengthens you. And as we heard in the song right before the sermon, he will hold you fast and he will sustain you to be a faithful father. Now maybe as you listen to the sermon, maybe you are reminded of yourselves, of your unfaithfulness. Maybe you were not as faithful. Maybe as a dad, you, you cherish sin in your life and you caused pain to your family. Maybe you put yourselves above your family. And let me tell you this morning, instead of running away and hiding in shame like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, let us run to Jesus. And let us find joy and forgiveness in the cross. Christ is our only hope. Our only hope to perfect obedience that we require because it is Christ who accomplished that for us. And as parents, if you are in Christ, you are defined by that righteousness. Not by how good a dad you are or how effective as a parent you are. In Christ, you are defined by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Today, let me give you a roadmap. Let me help you understand verse 4. We all love roadmaps. I hate to drive without a roadmap. And so as we're reading through verse 6, chapter 6, verse 4, first let me see, let me show you there's a negative command. And then there's a positive command. The negative command is children, uh, sorry, parents, do not provoke your children. That's a negative command. The positive command is that fathers, you are to bring them up. Now, if you see fathers, you're to bring them up. And then Paul goes on to give two subpoints in the later half of verse 4. How? If you read verse 4, it says, Fathers, you're to bring them up by discipline and instruction of the Lord. So let's begin with verse 4, and we'll split it up into two, 4a and 4b. Verse 4a, are you irritating them? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul tells uh, the children to obey their parents, and he uses a word that's applicable to both father and mother. Now here in verse 4, he speaks directly to fathers. Now he uses the word called patera in the Greek, and that word patera is applicable for both moms and dads. So that's why when I'm, I'm talking about this, it's not just directly to dads. We're talking to moms and dads. 
In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, he speaks to dads, but he uses only 20 words. 20 words. And as Paul uses 20 words to speak to dads, the first thing he tells is, Fathers, do not provoke your children. So children, take your Bibles and highlight that in your Bibles. Yes, do not provoke your children. Don't irritate your children. Don't make them angry. Don't embitter them. Don't dishearten them, is what Paul says. This word provoke is in the present tense. Grammatically, so that means it's a warning that parents must strive to pay attention to continually, day by day, in their every life situation. It's an ongoing aspect. Do not provoke. Because when we provoke our children, we are doing them more harm. So it would be better to leave them in their condition instead of provoking them. Because that does more harm to them. How do we provoke them? Before we look at ways we can provoke our children, let me uh, tell you, uh, what Paul does here. He, he puts the entire teaching on household. We looked at how wives need to submit and how husbands need to love their wives and, and how uh, parents, uh, how children are to obey their parents. All of this teaching on household is, is actually preceded by an important verse in the book of Ephesians, and that's found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. So in your Bibles, if you, if you read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. What Paul is trying to tell is that if you're not under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you will react differently. You will get easily irritated, you will be easily provoked, you will lose your power. Uh, patience, you will lack balance, you will lack judgment, you will be controlled by your passions, you will snap, you will snarl, you will scream, you will yell. In other words, you will be like the man who is under the influence of alcohol, lacking self-control. But on the other hand, if you're a Christian... You are under the influence of the Spirit of God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You'll be under the influence of the Spirit of God. And when you and I are under the influence of the Spirit of God, you have control over your communication. You have control over your tone, over your body language. Overall, you want to honor Christ. Therefore, according to Paul, when you're disciplining your child, the most important thing to ascertain is that you have, first of all, controlled yourself. And how do you do that? By being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit is not controlling you, something else will. True? This is why it's important to be filled with the Spirit. So having seen that, I believe if the Apostle Paul were to be talking to you right now, you would have said, wait a minute, gentlemen. Wait a minute, parents, moms, dads. I want you to remember Ephesians 5.18. That's why I exactly did that right now. Now let's look at ways we provoke our children. There's a book by Lou Priolo, The Heart of Anger, and he has given 25 ways we provoke our children. And if I were to do that right now, we would not get to our part like in time. I'm going to just pick a few. And I'm going to give you a few ways we provoke our children. First, by being capricious or whimsical. If you're inconsistent or unpredictable in your discipline, 
then your child is going to be frustrated. When you're in a good mood, you're prone to overlook some offenses. As opposed to when you're in a bad mood. The child is unsure about your mood and, and so he's frustrated. And there's nothing more annoying to a child to have a parent who is unpredictable. A capricious person lacks self-control. It's like being around a moody person. Have you been around a moody person? You really don't know what's going on. One, one moment is good, another moment unpredictable. So, first by being capricious. Second, by being selfish. Sometimes parents act as if children have no choice in any matter. Child's desires don't really matter. I mean, as parents, we are stewards, we are guardians of the children that the Lord has entrusted to our cares. And sometimes as parents, we forget this. And we become domineering. And we bark orders at our children. Being selfish. Sometimes parents want to live out their dream through their children. They may have wanted to be a sportsman or a musician, and so they push their children to accomplish those things that they themselves couldn't accomplish. And so they push them, or sometimes the parents may have excelled in something, and so they want their children to excel in that as well. The story of a man who was an accomplished horse rider, he had told his wife, I learned how to ride before I learned how to walk. And when his son was three years old, he put him on a horse, put him on a horse and dressed him as a cowboy and wanted him to ride like he had ridden when he was a young child. And his child burst out crying and hated being on the horse and was upset. And the father was furious at his son. He wanted his son to be able to do what he had done when he was a little boy. His wife had to remind him, your son is not you. And sometimes we hear that, right, from our wives. Many parents need this reminder because often parents want children to do things that are very, very important to them personally, but may or may not be a part of the unique calling or abilities that the Lord has given your child. That's selfishness. Third, by being critical without praise. Parents can sometimes be very negative and, and critical of their children. All they see in their children is all the things that have gone wrong. If they come home with a report card and there's a B plus, the father tells the child, I want you to turn that B plus into an A. If they get a 97 on their math quiz, the question asked is, why didn't you get a I know this because I'm guilty of it myself. It's like there are 20 sprinklers. And you notice the one broken sprinkler. Instead of appreciating the 19 sprinklers that are fully functioning, you notice the one broken sprinkler. Parents, look for the good things that your children do. And praise them for it because you'll find plenty of ways to be critical about things their child does. Fourth, by hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a characteristic that should be guarded against. Your children can smell hypocrisy from miles away. We need to practice what we preach. For example, dads will scream at their wives, yell at their wives, and then they'll come to church and put on the church face. I don't know if there is something like that. Parents, your children will see through this facade and eventually become like you. They will assume that having double standards is normal behavior. When you sin against your wife, or your children, they need to see that you're willing to confess your sin, ask them for forgiveness. They need to see humility in you. They need to see brokenness in you. 
Isn't that what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5? Verse 24 says, Leave your gift there before the altar. Go first be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Fifth, by disciplining your children out of anger. The psalmist states in Psalm 38, verse 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, not discipline me in your wrath. psalmist is saying that. Lord, don't do that. You see, when you are angry, it is very easy to discipline. In fact, over-discipline. Remember the story in the Old Testament when Balaam, he became angry at his donkey. He struck the donkey with a stick. And, and Balaam went on to say in Numbers 22 that if he had a sword, he would have killed the donkey. Children are sometimes treated like that by angry parents. In case of Balaam, he stuck the donkey in haste. He stuck the donkey because the donkey embarrassed him. And Balaam was out of control. He lacked self-control. As you discipline your children, you must discipline in love rather than out of anger. Discipline must be exercised in love. Let me give you a sixth one. Sixth by disciplining them in front of others. Disciplining them in front of others. I witnessed some parents spank their children in front of other people. Yes, I mean, when your child disobeys the parent in public, the child needs to be corrected. The child needs to be rebuked. But keep in mind that when you chastise or discipline your child in public, your child's spirit is crushed, discouraged. Why? Because children are fragile. They can be devastated when you chastise them publicly. I mean, parents, can you wait till you get home? Can you tell them, you know, we'll deal with this later when we go home? And if it's a public sin, correct them publicly, but don't chastise them publicly. In fact, when you whack them in public, I believe even the people watching that will be uncomfortable with what you're doing. Think about this. When you make a mistake at work and your boss corrects you in front of your co-workers, will it crush your spirit? Yes. You would expect your boss to call you into his office and correct you one-on-one -on -one and he'll receive it well. In the same way, parents... You don't want you don't you want to extend the same respect and opportunity to your child? By disciplining them in front of others. Matthew 18, verse 15 reads, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. There's a principle there. Lou Perillo states, the circle of confession and correction should only be as large as a circle of offense. If your child sins in the presence of others, he or she may be verbally rebuked, but never physically disciplined or chastised in the presence of others. Seventh, hang in there. By overprotecting your child. Overprotecting your child. If you fence them and you never give them the opportunity to, to, opportunity to take on responsibilities, if you're always wanting to protect them from making any mistakes, coming to their aid when they make, the, make mistakes, you will never allow them to grow. Some mommies follow their son even to college. They don't want to lose their babies. You try to be the shadow in their lives, so when they fall down, you can catch them. They're called helicopter parents. Mommy will come to their rescue even when they are in college, even when they go to work. They want to make sure that they're doing the right work. They wouldn't even hesitate to actually call up the boss and talk to the boss. Parents. 
parents, you need to allow your child to make mistakes. As long as you've given them wisdom, as long as you've told them and you've walked with them, if they do not follow through with it, they would need to learn from their experience. And Fu said, you need to have perfect children. Didn't I tell you this last week? We have one perfect father. And what kind of children does he have? Imperfect children. And we are imperfect parents. And what kind of children do we expect? Perfect children. Does it make sense? Is that the reason we overprotect them? Because we are afraid that they will make mistakes? Eighth, by failing to keep your promise. Try not to break promises. I agree. I understand that sometimes you have jobs and your time and it's important that you need to accomplish certain things. You need to take care of your job. You need to bring a paycheck home. But if you do this all the time, your children will resent you and will not trust you because if you say something, you need to follow through with it. Let your yes be an yes and a no be a no. When Arthur Gordon, the British colonial administrator, he was 13 years of age, and his brother, 10, their father had promised to take them to the circus. But while the father was home for lunch, there was a phone call. Some urgent business required his attention at work. The two boys braced themselves for disappointment. But then they heard their father say, No, I won't be there. It will have to wait. When he came back to the table, his wife smiled and said, the circus keeps coming back to town. You know that, right? The wise father said, yes, I know, but childhood doesn't. Lastly, I could go on, but be consistent with your words. Be consistent with what you say. When you tell them I'll spank you and you don't spank them, guess what children are going to do? They know that that's not consistent. I don't know if you've experienced this, but you're driving on the freeway and your children misbehave in the car. And what do you say? Next time you do that, I'm going to stop the car on the side of the freeway and I'm going to drop you off on the freeway. Are you really going to do that? You're not. If you do that, you're in trouble. <laughs> Why say things that you're not going to do? Be consistent. Let's come to the later half of verse 4. And that is, bring them up in the discipline of the Lord and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up in the discipline of the Lord and instruction of the Lord. And the point is, are you disciplining them and instructing them? The verse begins with bring them up. It means to rear, bring them to maturity, provide them, support them, take tender care of them, give them all that they need to grow to maturity. The, 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 the words in the English Bible, bring them up, is one word in the Greek language. It's the word ektropo. And it's in the present tense. Let me give you some grammatical observations on that verb. It's in the present tense. This means continuous action. You need to be continuously bringing them up. Keep at it. Don't stop. There are no coffee breaks in parenting. Because if you do it continuously or keep at it continuously, it's manageable. Uh, if you wait until later... Or until you think your children are ready, the sheer number of issues will just be overwhelming. This is why Paul says, bring them up continuously. It starts from the time your children are born. This verb is in the active voice. Meaning your parents are to bring them up. It's not passive. It's not that they're going to raise themselves. You need to bring them up. 
Some parents have had passive attitude to parenting. Why? Because they're given to believe that maybe their rebellion in the children is kind of a passing fad. Maybe children will eventually get over that. And, and, and they would say things like, well, children all are going to rebel, rebel at some point of time. No, that's not biblical. Rebellion is bound in the heart of a child, but that's not the norm. The work of sanctification that the Lord does in life through the word of God, can change a child. Some, some parents believe that the reason the child rebels is because of external circumstances. Either the child is sick or a trauma that the child has gone through. I hear parents make statements such as this, my poor child is in a lot of stress right now and that's why he or she is acting up. You've heard that? And if there is no reason whatsoever, then there's a label. There's plenty of labels available today. We are living in a psychologized world. There's either a label or a syndrome. I've even heard parents make a statement. Well, my child wouldn't do anything like that. Or they're too young to be corrected. We'll wait for the child to grow up before disciplining the child. Some parents uh, use kind of things like this. Well, you know, my child just lost a grandma. Or we just moved homes. They're a lot, under a lot of stress. Or we're too busy with other things in our lives right now. There's too much going on. When we are settled, I'll handle the situation. And so because of these things, parents just take a passive role in the lives of their children because everything the child does is blamed on circumstances. And one day the circumstances will change and parents think that will change their children. And so they are passive about it. Beloved parents, you and I are not given any options here. We are to take an active role in the life of our children, in bringing them up, in maturing them. And not only that, let me give you another grammatical observation. This verb, ektrepo, is in the imperative. And when you hear the word imperative, it means a command. God is commanding you to be actively and to be continuously and with authority bring up your children. It's not a suggestion. So how are we to do it? There are two key words in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4b. Two key words. And the two key words are first, discipline, and the second, instruction. Let's look at the first word in the discipline of the Lord. This is the Greek word, paideia. It refers more specifically to chastisement. Parents are to discipline their children. How do you train up your child? Well, there are rules, there are regulations, there are guidelines, there are restrictions, there are rewards, there's correction, there's structure. I mean, these are the guardrails that you put in place for your children that your child has a framework to grow up in wisdom and in understanding. Children need guardrails. They need home rules. That's why you have rules and regulations. Why? Because children are naive. They just run into trouble. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 4 reads, To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Children are gullible. They rush headlong into evil, and so they need discipline. They need structure to help them learn and grow in wisdom. Now one thing the parent needs to remember is that the law or the instruction set in place is not only for the purpose of shaping the child's character or behavior, it is also a means the parents use to point them to the Savior. Because what happens when you have the law? Are you able to keep the law perfectly? What does it remind us? Our need for a Savior. 
In the same way, when you have these set of regulations for your children, and your children constantly fail in keeping that, as a parent, you come alongside and show them how much they need Christ. Another aspect of training, a paideia, is the correction aspect, the discipline. Parental correction helps the child to learn that when you break the law, there are consequences. Whatever you sow, you will reap. And that includes the use of a rod. And the Bible states that very clearly in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. You see, discipline or chastisement or this Greek word paideia is the teeth that you have as parents to enforce your discipline. Is that clear? It's like this. The California Highway Patrol has got rules. Now when you come to the stop sign, you're supposed to stop your car, not roll over. You're to come to a full stop. And if there were no fines, would anyone even care to follow those rules? But there is a, 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 a policeman who stands there, an officer who catches you and finds you. So the fine is kind of the teeth that the law has to make sure that you keep the law. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18, Discipline your child, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Just because the state laws will tell you that it is wrong to discipline your child using the rod does not mean you scratch these verses out of the Bible. As we read, whom must we obey, God or man? God. We must obey God rather than man. Of course, we must be careful that in correcting the child, we are not abusing our authority as a parent. That we are not physically abusing our children in anger. Physical abuse is not biblical. God doesn't call dads to be sergeant major. On the contrary, parents, when you use the rod in a biblical manner, in a loving manner, it actually proves that you love your child and that you are a loving parent. Now, some parents are afraid to discipline their child using the rod for fear that it will make their child timid. Some parents say, I've never been disciplined, so I'm not going to discipline my child. Or maybe you've heard horror stories of how children have become violent. Beloved parents, whom do you trust? Do you trust the philosophy of this world? Or do you trust the Word of God that gives you the command that you got to lovingly correct your child? And if you follow through with what the Bible tells you, God will give you the strength and the grace to do it God's way. Here are some principles on how to use the rod. So children, please bear with me on this. How to use the rod. First, I'm speaking to parents. Check if clear directions were given and that your child obeyed without challenge, excuse, or delay. Ask yourself, or ask the child, was the child being stubborn? Did the child demonstrate his or her stubbornness by pouting, grumbling, or sulking? Was the child saying no with his, his or her body language? Ask proper questions to understand the body language. Did the child make any disrespecting or dishonoring statements? Was lying involved? And as you do this, require the child to acknowledge guilt and accept responsibility. Ask the child as to what choice should he or she have made. Call the child to repentance. 
and pray that God would bring true repentance in the heart of a child. The child needs to understand that the child has offended God. And then, once you've done all these things, administer the correction calmly and thoroughly. Don't spank in such a way that would injure the child. Corporate, corporal punishment should be moderate, reasonable, and age-appropriate. The discipline needs to be thorough to cause reflection and sorrow that may bring change. And children should be chastised privately. Avoid disciplining the child in a public setting. And then, discuss with the child what you're going to do next time a similar situation arises. How could the child handle that situation differently? Remind your child that your goal as his parent is, or her parent is to come alongside them, to comfort them, and to strengthen them, and to help them. And then comfort the child. Hug the child. And pray for the child. And pray with him or pray for her. Instruct the child to ask God for forgiveness. And if it's a public sin, ask forgiveness from the others around them. Don't bring up the offense again with the child unless it is to teach them something. And always look for an opportunity to encourage the child. A few things that you can follow as you're administering corporal punishment. Let's go to the later half of that verse. It says the next key word is bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. So we looked at the discipline aspect. The next is instruction. Literally the word instruction means the idea of putting into the mind. It means to equip the mind. It's the Greek word nautasia. It means admonition. That's where we get biblical counseling from. Nautasia. Equipping the mind with the word of God. So here, the Apostle Paul is teaching the parents the importance of teaching the children the Word of God. You need to bring the truth of God's Word to the mind of the child. You need to teach God's Word to the child. Teach him or her the attributes of God. Teach them about the holiness of God. Teach them how to handle their, uh, the affairs of their life through the Word of God. Help them to see their life through the lens of God's Word. Help them how to handle anxiety and stress through God's word. They would need that because they are entering into a world when the world is handling anxiety and stress through a lot of means other than the word of God. And so help them to see that. Teach them the importance of scriptures in their daily lives. Isn't that what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6? Verses 6 through 9. Would you please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 6 through 9. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and you walk by the way, and when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them up as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You need to come alongside them and give them instructions from the scriptures. You see, as a child grows up, there is discipline. And there's a point of time that discipline veers off or tapers off and there's more instruction given from God's word. The child needs both discipline and instruction. There's a well-balanced approach. If you haven't disciplined your child as a young little one growing up and you try to give the child instruction when he's a teenager, you have been unbalanced in your parenting. You need to give the child discipline and at the same time teach them God's word. 
how much and how little differs as the child grows up. Obviously, you're not going to get to your sophomore kid and discipline them corporately. You will give the son more instruction from God's word. You see, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto all good work. So there is an instruction that is needed. And let me wrap up verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 6. It says it is to be done in the Lord. It's of the Lord. That means it's not moralistic education. It focuses on the child's faith. You need to make sure that as you're bringing up the child, as you're disciplining the child, you are understanding that it is from the Lord. Without the Lord giving you the strength and the grace, you cannot do it, nor can discipline and instruction be separated from the Lord. It is all focused on building up the child's faith in Christ Jesus. So parents, let's be involved in God's business of raising a godly generation. Let us be proactive. Let's be actively involved in their lives. Let us use God's ways, God's methods, God's tools to be parents for the glory of God. In closing, I want to close with a sermon, uh, with, a, with a story. It's a poem written by Harry Chapin's wife, Sandy Chapin. This was written um, early on, was sung by Johnny Cash in the 1980s, but this is how it goes. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. There were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking before I knew it, and as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we will gather together then. You know we'll have a good time then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I've got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but a smile never dimmed. It said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, I know I'm going to be like him. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll gather together then. You know we'll have a good time then. Well, he came from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, what I really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we will gather together then, Dad. You know we'll have a good time then. I've long since retired and my son's moved away. I called him just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids are the flu, but sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he had grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, son, I don't know when, but we will get together then. Dad, we are going to have a good time then. Dads, let's redeem the time. Parents, let's get to the business of what the Bible says, of raising up a generation for the glory of God. Father, we thank you. We thank you that as we listen to this passage, that we are reminded that Jesus is enough for us. That you are sufficient for our parenting, that you are enough to help us to be parents, even when it is difficult. That you are sufficient to forgive our sins and to sustain us. We pray for the fathers in our church that you will hold them up. That they would be godly men and they would lead their homes with godliness. 
that you would be sufficient for the children in our church as we wrap up this section on homes, that you would give them the grace to be obedient to their parents. Father, we pray that you would revolutionize our homes, Father, and change us forever for your glory. Would you please do that? Give us insight from God's word. Saturate us with with a hunger from God's word that we would use the principles of God's word to raise our families. Thank you for giving us wisdom. Thank you for transforming us each day, making us more and more like you. You be honored and glorified through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.